Okay. Calling into session. Uh, February 15, 2022, three o'clock agenda for Public Safety, Intergovernmental and Military Affairs and Committee on Higher Education. Okay. First bill we have is Senate Bill 2364. And that testifies list we have William Oshijo. William, are you there? I am here, but um, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. so this is Robin Wurzel on behalf of the Civil Rights Commission. Um, Chair, Vice Chair, oh. Yep. Sorry, there's messages popping up. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, the Civil Rights Commission stands on its written testimony in strong opposition to this bill. We're available for questions if needed. Okay, thank you. Dori Itanigawa, send in comments. Hi, Okimoto, send in comments. Patrick Mananaman sent out uh, opposition to it and Mike Angola Hugh Senior support. Um, are there any others? Uh, have we been on listed? Otherwise... I think, um, I think Laurie was on. Is Laurie on to testify from the Attorney General's? Hi, Laurie. Laurie Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Out. Good afternoon, Lori Tanigawa, Deputy Attorney General. The department submitted its written comments, um, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, Members, any questions? Otherwise, we'll move on to Senate Bill 2640 and Max Otani. Max. Vice Chairs, Committee Members, Max Otani, Department of Public Safety. Uh, the department will stand on our written testimony supporting the intent of this measure and offer comments in our written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Betts sent in comments. Uh, Craig Hirai sent in comments. Lauren Walker, are you there, Lauren? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here for the Hawaii Women's Prison Project and also for the Hawaii Friends of Restorative Justice. And um, we really support this measure. It's really important. Education has been shown to be the best way to reduce repeat crime. And uh, the people in prison are people who were who slipped through the educational cracks. You already know, I think, I believe that their, their grade level is only like fourth to sixth grade. And um, what we've done so far with this program, remarkably, the women's prison only had an average of three women a year passing the GED. And since we started this program, that started, it started in November in earnest. By um, December, like seven people passed. And by today, and they've had shutdowns of COVID, 10 women have passed the GED, which is just, it's really remarkable. So yeah, we heartily support this measure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, So uh, I think Lauren already called you up, yeah, already. So uh, Deborah Halbert in support, uh, Jen Wilbur in support, Ellen Johnson in support, Kat Brady in support, uh, Colleen Ross Bannock in support, Carla Carlden in support, Nikki Ann Yee in support, Carmen Hulu Lindsay in support, and Freed in support. Carrie Ann Shirota in support, um, Ashley Galagak in support. And I think that pretty much runs us through the list. Members, any questions? I have a question for Max Otani. Okay, Max. Yes. This is Senator Kidani. I'm um, wondering, um, how do you prepare your inmates who are ready to be released or getting ready to be released to be out on the street so they can find proper jobs, et cetera? Do they, are they able to get uh, 
their driver's license or any kind of ID that may be needed? This is for female inmates or inmates? And as inmates in general. I think the same thing applies to your, your male inmates who need to, There's, when they're coming out. So ideally we would like to get inmates into the furlough phase and community level phase before they're eligible for release on parole. Um, as they move to the, the system, you know, from medium security to minimum security, counselors assist them in trying to get their, the documents needed to get their state ID. Uh, we have been working for some time now to get, to um, assist the, the city in reproducing IDs. So we're very close, Senator, very close. Um, you know, we, we recently got the machine, you know, we're trying to establish training with the city. Uh, we're not making our own IDs, we're actually producing IDs uh, with the city's permission. Uh, but as, you know, as the inmate goes through sequential phasing, um, you know, required programs are completed and they're, they're put into less secure environment and then eventually, you know, allowed to go out and see for I don't know if I answered your question. Doesn't the state have an ID system? The state, we, well, this, this, um, I, I think it's, it's my belief that the IDs are printed under the Department of Transportation, which is, I guess, contracted out to the city. So we have been working with the city. That's, that's for driver's licenses, I think. But I believe I thought the state had a state ID program also. The, the driver's license and the state IDs are, I believe, consolidated. We will be printing state IDs. Say that again. You will be printing. We we are working with the city to get that machine running. We recently got the machine, and we're working on training and uh, I guess the, the internet hookup with the city. Thank you for doing that. Do you know what time or about when that you, that's expected to happen? I'm hoping in the next few months, I kept saying this, but you know, there's been hang up some changes with um, leadership at the city has prevented us from moving ahead, but they seem to be secure now. So I'm hoping in the next month or two, we would, uh, once we do, we will let we will let the public know that, you know, we finally got it moving. Um, yeah, so if there's, you know, um, any assistance that we can give in helping you reach out to city officials or we can, uh, the Women's Legislative Caucus or the other uh, caucuses that are helping our women prisoners. And again, this is not just for the women, I, you know, for our men too, that need to have some form of ID so they can go out and find jobs. but. If you feel that you need us to intervene, please let us know because this is really important to all of us. Mahalo. Thank, Thank you, you, Max. Assistance. Chair, I also had a question. Go ahead. Uh, for Max as well, Otani. Mr. Otani, so uh, I'm looking at your testimony and we're talking about GED, a total of nine women earned a GED and diplomas. So, and then six went on to enroll in post-education secondary programs. So are they able to get credit and is that these credits able to transfer over if they then get into, accepted into any of the university programs? Yes, I believe those programs, I mean, it, it, it's applicable to the university programs. And is this taught online? Is that how those um, courses are being taught? those uh, college credit courses? It's online. Um, I know with the males, we have um, working with Chaminade University and we have um, lectures going into the Halaba Correctional Facility on a, on a project right now. Um, for the fee go ahead. What kind of fees are, are the colleges charging um, the state for these programs? Um, I'm not sure about the females, but the male is a Pell Grant. So uh, it's covered under the grant. Can you get back to us regarding the women's? Sure. Thank you. All right. Members, any questions, other questions?
Hey, Senator uh, Kim, do you want to go to the break room? Um, no, I'm fine. You want to go ahead and make your recommendations? Okay. Um, the first bill, shall we just go directly into the bill? Yeah, decision making on. Um, yeah. Okay. SB 2364. Yeah, uh, recommendations to defer this indefinitely. It seems to be unconstitutional and discriminatory, so we're going to defer this bill indefinitely. No objection. Okay. And the second bill, 2640, Senate Bill 2640, um, there's technical amendments. Um, I know there are some people that have concerns, so we're going to pass it with uh, technical amendments. Chair goes eye on this one. Members voting on members voting on SB two six four zero. Uh, chair passing with amend passing. Sorry, chair. Can you do that again? I'm sorry. Oh. Technical amendments. Passing. Technical amendments. Chair, uh, Technical members amendments. voting on SB 2640 passing with amendments. Chair and Vice Chair vote aye. Uh, Senator Baker. Excuse. Senator Rivera. Aye. Aye. Senator Favela. Yeah. Senator Was Baker's I back. There, I'm on. Oh, Senator okay. Baker. Aye. All right, Senator Favela, excuse, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Okay, for Higher Education Committee, same recommendation, pass Senate Bill 2640 with technical and non-substantive amendments. Um, me members, any discussion? Hearing none, Chair votes aye. Senator Kidani. Senate Bill 2640, pass with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Keith Agaran. Aye. Senator Wakai. Yes. Senator Favela. Excuse, measures adopted, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Senator Nishihara with the PSM committee. We will now go into the higher education so, committee. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, okay, so I'm on Gav yeah. in for the Higher Education Committee, and we are being streamed live on YouTube, and we'll cover the uh, three o'clock Higher Education Committee hearing. In the unlikely event we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business. This coming Thursday is February 17 at 3 p.m. in this room 229, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. And for testifiers uh, participating remotely, your audio will be muted and video disabled shortly before it's your turn to testify, and you will be limited to one minute. At the end of that minute, the audio will automatically be muted. I have no control over that, so don't blame me. <laughs> I'll be reading a list of individuals who submitted testimony for each measure. Uh, we do apologize if the closed caption doesn't accurately transcribe your names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website. You'll find a link on the status page for the measure. And if there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. But we do appreciate your understanding and uh, remind you that we do have your written testimony. So with no further ado, we'd like to start off with uh, first measure uh, for this is on Senate Bill 3340 relating to the University of Hawaii Maui College Molokai Education Center. It appropriates funds to the University of Hawaii Maui College to purchase 14, actually not purchase, but to have 14.5 acres of land from Kamehameha Schools in Kalamaula, Molokai to expand and relocate the Molokai Education Center. Uh, let's see, we have comments from Craig Key Rye from Department of Budget and Finance, Kawi Burgess from Kamehameha Schools. Kawi, are you here? Aloha mai kako. Aloha. E kaluna, e kaluna ho'o maluke, ka hopiluna ho'o maluki tani, a me na lala o kia komike ho'o na awao, kunga nui o ka aha kene kua. Aloha mai kako. 
Okay, Ian No Kau I Burgess. I serve our educational trust, Kamehameha Schools, as a director of community and government relations. I'm here to testify on behalf of Kamehameha Schools in support of SB 3340, which appropriates funds to the University of Hawaii Maui College to expand and relocate Molokai Education Center. Um, Hanai Ikekeki Ola Kalahui means nurture the child and the people will thrive. This is an ola lo noel that we at Kamehameha Schools use within our own organization to guide our decision-making and how we spend our time and as well as our resources. And um, we believe that when we together, when we all focus on nurturing Hawaii's children, Hawaii's learners, that Hawaii will thrive. We believe that Hawaii will, will thrive. Kamehameha Schools recognizes that the well-being of our keiki is directly impacted by the environment that surrounds our keiki. And this includes a thriving post-secondary education campus on Molokai. Its ability to grow and to thrive will positively and directly impact the resilience of the families on that island. And as we were quoted in the Civil Beat News article this morning, uh, relating to this bill. Advancing post-secondary education and career pathways is critical to resilient communities. And helping Hawaii to create and build resilient communities is one of three strategic goals that Kamehameha Schools has, because we know that the well-being of every child and every family, um, including Native Hawaiian children and families throughout Hawaii, will be impacted, uplifted, and supported by those resilient communities. And so we applaud. Thank you. We also Please support. Have, thank you. Thank you. Alice Lee, chair of the Maui County Council uh, as an individual in support. And I believe we have written testimony from University of Hawaii, uh, Erica LaCro in support. Uh, anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? Aloha, Chair, Aloha Chair Kim. Um, I'm Louis Hokuana, the Chancellor at um, Maui College. And um, on behalf of the University of Hawaii, I stand in support of Senate Bill 3340. Um, if there are any questions um, related to the bill, I'm available to answer your questions. Mahalo. Thank you. Apologize for not having you on the list. Anyone else wishing to testify? Hearing non members' questions. I do have a question, I guess, from Kamehameha Schools, Howie. So just as a cl clarification, my understanding is this funding that is being asked for is not to purchase the land, but is just to relocate the Maui right, Education Center. Is that correct? Right. We're interested in entering into conversations. We still need to do due diligence, and we want to enter into conversations with the state on um, a transaction that could take place in the future for the use of these lands. Our interest at this point, and we're still doing due diligence, but at this point, the interest is entering into a long-term lease with the state. Okay. Yeah. And the monies actually go to Maui College, right? And Maui- Yes. Um, government funding for anything. Right. Okay. Any. Any other questions, members? So is it moving the Molokai Education Center to a different site or yeah. different site completely? Correct. On Kamehameha land. Right. Still on Kamehameha land. So our properties are located above the sea level rise zone of inundation. And so therefore we've been approached. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, anyone Thank else? You, Louis. Any other questions, members? If not, thank you very much. Appreciate the testifiers. We will move on to our second item on the agenda, Senate Bill 91, Senate Draft 1, relating to the University of Hawaii. Remove the, this bill removes the special funds of the University of Hawaii and Hawaii Cancer Research Special Fund from the list of special funds that are exempt from the requirement to reimburse budget and finance for expenses incurred from administering the funds. Uh, I'd like to... Um, explain that this measure is uh, after 
talking with the chair on ways and means, I guess the intent was to not exempt the University of Hawaii from reporting and not necessarily from actually paying the 5% fee. So we will be making those recommendations as, uh, as this bill after the testifiers. So uh, I know we have uh, people concerned, uh, including the university on the cost that it might um, be if they were exempt or not exempt. So Calvert Young, you wanna go ahead and give your testimony? Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon uh, and good afternoon members. Uh, Chair, with your comments, I think, I don't think the university has any objections to the reporting requirements, but that's not what the uh, proposed bill right. is drafted. And so I think you've made clarification and my testimony is in opposition, but related specifically to uh, the issues that you've uh, raised. Happy to answer any questions though that you may have. Thank you. And then we have Cynthia Al testifying for American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. Thank you, Chair Kim, Vice Chair Kidani, and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, thank you again for uh, clarifying earlier um, about the bill. Um, we respectfully oppose, you know, the um, making it more expensive for the cancer center to operate. So thank you again for addressing that. Um, we are just here to support the cancer center in any way that we can because over 2,500 lives in Hawaii is lost to cancer each year and is the second leading cause of death in the state. The UH, UH Cancer Center is one of 71 research organizations in the US designated by the the National Cancer Institute and the only one in the Hawaii Pacific region. So we just thank you again and ask for your continued support of the work that the Cancer Center does to prevent, diagnose, and treat cancers unique to the people of Hawaii and in the Pacific region to improve cancer patients' quality of life and outcomes. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Jenny Hausler, individual in opposition. Jenny, are you here online? No. Okay, anyone else wishing to testify on this measure? If not, again, I'd like to reiterate, uh, this measure was actually requested by Ways and Means, is a means of transparency. And the way the measure is written, section 36-30, it gives the special funds uh, exemption and it lists all the funds that are exempted. But then on the second portion, it also uh, exempts them from the reporting of the special fund, the salaries, the maintenance of buildings and grounds, utilities, office expenses, et cetera. And they would be exempt from that. And I think that is what the uh, money committee would like us to be able to find out from the special funds exactly what, uh, how much is in the funds, where are these funds going, how are they being extended? And so uh, that is basically what we're going to be, uh, be recommending. So are there any other questions of the testifiers? If not, we will move on to the next measure. Uh, Senate Bill 2302 relating to the Chief Procurement Officer designates the Vice President of Budget and Finance and Chief Financial Officer of the University of Hawaii as Chief Procurement Officer for the university. Um, we have comments from the university. Is that you, Calbert? Or is it Jan Govea that, that testified? Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, both Vice President Govea and I uh, have submitted testimony offering you comments. Uh, the relevant uh, points are just to identify the uh, current procurement structure within the uh, current procurement organization structure within the university is currently situated under the uh, vice president for administration. Vice president for administration is not the designated chief procurement officer uh, under statute that is the university president. Um, and so this bill proposes to uh, designate the the university CFO as the chief procurement officer, um, that structure currently does not exist. And in the procurement organization of the university, uh, currently the CFO is not involved in uh, procurement uh, as part of the normal process. Uh, happy to answer any additional questions the committee may have. And again, Vice President Govea is also available for uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President Govea. Hi, Chair. Good afternoon. Afternoon. 
you have are you oh no um i Talbert, uh vice president young and i um both provided um, joint testimony and um, i echo everything that he just said okay we also have testimony from hawaii regional council of carpenters in support members uh any questions no okay i have questions so um I guess Calvert. So, do you know of any other university uh, in the country that the president of the university is the CF? I mean, is the procurement chief procurement officer? Uh, sorry, chair, I, I I don't know, but I I also didn't uh, research that, so okay, I can't Jan, say that there are any. Jan, do you know of any? Um, I do not know of any. You know, specifically off the top of my head, no. Okay, um, I know Bonnie, our chief procurement officer for a procurement did do a check and could uh, believe did not find any institution. Any, you know, specifically off the top of my head, no. Okay, um, I know Bonnie, our chief procurement officer for a procurement did do a check and could uh, believe did not find any institution that had the president as the chief procurement officer. Um, I can think concerns were raised during the procurement uh, special committee meetings about the possible conflict that exists, especially when President Lasner said that in, in comments or in response to questions about conflicts of interest and whether or not the chief procurement officer could rule on violations or rule on whether or not there were uh, situations where the scope of the project was being expanded, um, made the comment that as the president of the university, he has to do what is best for the university, which we understand that, but wearing the other hat makes it very difficult uh, to do that. And we found that there are many universities that the CFO, in fact, is a chief procurement officer. Um, the other options would be to have the state do it, have Bonnie be the uh, chief procurement officer or DAGS. Uh, that's the other possibilities. We know that the university would probably prefer to have keep it in-house. Um, and so that is why this measure is here. Now, while I have uh, Jan Govea here, in the Ching Field um, procurement, which we raise a lot of concerns regarding the scope and so forth, uh, we checked with OSHA today and found out that, in fact, two of the vendors in which you folks contracted with were fined uh, for violations. So um, does the university have any comments regarding that? Uh, no, we have no comments. I'm sorry? We have no comments. You have no comments. So these are these are vendors that you folks um, should have vetted, right, and so forth, and yet they were um, they received fines. So I'm not sure as to going forward on the process in which procurement uh, and how do you vet these these vendors? Because in the sense of um, what was that company that did the supposedly were or yeah in production was actually hired by your contractor that was supposed to just lay the, um, the turf. So um, those are concerns. And again, it goes back to who is the chief procurement officer and who would make those uh, look into that to see whether or not they were in fact violations or whether we could have precluded those kinds of violations from occurring. Um, so, Calbert, as since you since you are the uh, CFO and this bill puts it under you, is that um, something that you are able and capable of doing? Uh, well, well, first of all, I, I, okay. So, um, I, I think in parts of organizations, including government organizations, where the CFO or the finance director is the procurement officer. So procurement used to be under the under me when I was the county of Maui finance director. So yes, procurement was a function that was under the finance director. But the, the issue there is 
uh, the, the finance director actually oversaw procurement. So under the current structure, if the procurement processes are actually under a different part of the organization and um, the chief procurement officer is in a different part of the organization, but not overseeing the procurement, that's a structure that I think needs to be, we would need to figure out how that process could actually work. Um, right now, the president is the designated chief procurement officer, but the president actually has oversight over all operations within the university. So it's within the hierarchical structure. Um, and that's why there's a lot of consistency with that arrangement for the judiciary, the superintendent of education. You know, it's the, basically it's the director of the department is the designated chief procurement officer, not some underling under the director. So um, can it be done? I, I think there are structures and processes that can be, nothing is impossible. But I think it's an organizational management organization process flow and bureaucracy that has to get um, worked out. Um, we did identify how much people uh, we university currently has in our offices of procurement. Um, so this is not a it's not a some inconsequential um, process that we have. You know these offices are somewhat substantial. So how that all of that procurement would flow into over my over to my side of the organization. That I think is, I, I'm not quite sure how that would work. How um, many, it would have to be. How many people um, in the procurement officer in the procurement office that is actually going to be over you oversee? So right now, um, Jan can correct me if I'm wrong, but right now procurement is bifurcated into two sections: capital projects or capital related um, procurement and non-capital, which is you know all operations, pencils, pens, papers, equipment, that type of thing. For the capital side, I think we are seeing there's about seven positions. And on the non-capital side, there's about five positions. So in total for all things procurement for the university, we're talking about a dozen positions uh, that coordinate and process uh, you know, all forms of procurement and, and procurement, the chief procurement officer actually would be responsible to oversee all things um, procurement. So it's not exclusively for construction um, projects. But you do have a procurement, don't you have like a procurement manager, a procurement person that actually does the day-to-day -day oversight? Uh, I believe there, so there is a director position director. in the Office of uh, Procurement Management under the uh, Vice President for Administration. Okay, so there is a procurement director and that is the person that actually, and that, per, that position is vacant? Jen? It's currently filled on an interim basis. For how long has it been on an interim basis? Um, I would say maybe almost two years. We've had a freeze in effect. And so this is one of those positions that, um, and I believe the position may have even been swept. Um, I can research that, but. Uh, so who's that? Who's acting as the procurement director? Carly Hisashima is the um, interim director of procurement on the goods and services side. And we have uh, Jamie Hole, who does it on the construction side. Okay, so you folks manage, I mean, UH has this thing about interim directors for almost everything. Um, it, it's amazing how we operate with interim directors over there. But the fact that you've had this interim director for two years, um, does that indicate? I'm not really sure what it indicates at this point. Um, <clears throat> so the president doesn't, doesn't physically oversee these individuals, correct? Um, in terms of direct supervision, no. Right. Yes. Who has no. direct supervision? 
Carly reports directly to me and Jamie reports to a woman named Lisa and Lisa reports directly to me. Okay, so, so is there, is there conflicts when you say they report directly to you? I don't believe so, no. Because as you oversee a lot of the projects that require procurement, correct? Like in the Qing field? I oversee actually multiple areas, but I don't, I provide management and oversight. I don't get too deeply involved in any of the day-to-day um, transactions or operational um, okay. elements of any of the departments. So who determined whether or not the scope of the procurement in fact was expanded beyond what's allowed? In the case of Chingfield, in the case of the Sinclair uh, move uh, dislocation or relocation where the committee looked at it and felt that these were expanded uh, scope. Uh, I believe the procurement, chief procurement officer, Bonnie also um, had written up a statement to that effect. So who makes those determination? So ultimately, it, there, is a, there is a process. And it starts with our project managers, who are the most familiar with the scope of the project. And that is done um, with the consultation with their supervisor, who is the director of project delivery, Nelson Lee. I think you've met with him um, several times. And they all, the PM, the CM, and the director of project delivery all sign off on a change order, which then gets um, processed through. Uh, on, if it's a construction, then it goes through the construction um, change order process with to, through the office under Jamie. Jamie then signs off on it. And ultimately, um, I sign off on it. So it's very similar to the Department of Education structure. Yeah, so ultimately you're responsible or you sign off on it as the person in charge of the overall projects, correct? And, yes, and we pattern so, it after the DOE. Okay, well, there's not to say that the DOE's uh, pattern works um, miraculously or seamlessly either, but I think in the concerns that was raised during the, our procurement, we found, we didn't find those kinds of issues in the DOE, but certainly found those issues at UH. Um, and so as um, transparency and having a person that is not directly supervising the projects, because in the case of Ching Field, there were 12 change orders, 12 change orders, and it went from laying of the turf to building of these suites and so forth and the bleachers, uh, which was a stretch uh, that the chief procurement officer said. So it wasn't just me saying that, the chief procurement officer ruled that. So in those cases, who would then, you would go to and, and uh, appeal that or somebody has to, the chief procurement officer, in the case of the president, he wants this thing built as quickly as possible. And so, you know, those kinds of infractions or those kinds of violations were allowed. Well, I think we disagree on whether or not it was um, appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, I think change orders are, um, it is an area that discretion is often applied um, and it takes, um, it's, it's, it's a part of an industry that um, the more experience you have in it, uh, the more uh, seasoned your judgment will be. But if you take a look at the, you know, the way the procurement laws are written around change orders, it, it doesn't provide a lot of guidance. Um, and oftentimes agencies have to make the best decision that they have when it's in front of them. In hindsight, um, can there be criticism made, you know, around any decision. Um, I think that's true about anything. Yeah, but I mean, the chief procurement officer of the state of Hawaii said that was beyond the scope. 
And if you're looking at Sinclair Library, come on, when we had the transfer of just uh, relocating, and then you guys went from that to imploding the building and demolishing a building. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of rocket science to look at um, what the scope is of the project and to make that determination. And so for you to sit there and say that, that is discretion, yes. And when that discretion is done incorrectly, then somebody has to say something and somebody has to hold you accountable. And right now that person holding accountable is not holding anybody accountable. Members, any other questions? Chair. Um, Senator Favela. Yeah, I just get a couple of them. Um, so I guess the first thing you can go to um, Young, um, I guess in the discussion on the CFO and uh, procurement, chief procurement officer, I heard you were saying, um, can you clarify a little bit about how, um, I guess in the mainland or certain places and certain positions are done differently? Um, when we have the, for the procurement chief. Can, can you clarify a little bit? I, 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 I didn't really understand what you were saying. Uh, Senator, I, 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 I don't, I think the question was if other university presidents are chief procurement officers and I said, I didn't know, but I did actually haven't really looked into this question. Um, so that was that. And the other question was regarding uh, how procure, if procurement, if I could, if I thought I could be the chief procurement officer and I, my response there, so I, maybe you're not aware, I, I used to be the director of finance for the county of Maui. And in the county of Maui, uh, one of the functions that is under the director of finance is the county's procurement office. So in that respect, I have overseen a procurement function, much like um, Vice President Govea is now overseeing procurement for the university. Um, so in that respect, I, you know, if you're asking me, can it be done? I would say, yeah, it can. The difference that I wanted to point out was that um, with the County of Maui and the university, the procurement person, the leader that's over the procurement actually has control over the actual procurement you know, functioning of the organization. And in the current university model, um, procurement is actually not under the CFO. This bill would make the CFO the, the chief procurement officer, but we would have to evaluate how that the actual mechanics of work processes would flow in order to ensure that the whoever is the chief procurement officer, you know, gets over to the other side of the organization. Yeah. It, was that your question, Senator? Yeah, that's, thank you. And then, um, sorry, Jan, I got a question for you. <coughs> when, um, again, going back to the procurement of uh, Ching Stadium, um, first when the bid went in, I mean, you can correct me with the numbers because I'm not as good with the numbers, but when going to Ching, field when the bid went out, um, wasn't it for about a million dollars? I think roughly. Yeah. Okay, I don't okay. Let me give you the example. Now, the reason why, the re well, how I'm going through with this is because that was a different fund, right? Wasn't that coming out of, uh, it, was it, was it um, goods and services? Was that, was a, original, the money was coming out of that department or um, the original planning for Ching Stadium? What 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 um, area the money was coming from? The... For pay for, the, for, pay for this uh, stadium or whatever, where, when the procurement went in uh, for, the, for the amount, what department was paying for it? What kind of contract? Well, it's the universe. It's it's the University of Hawaii, right? As a, it's one from a right. fund standpoint, it sits within the University of Hawaii. Um, but we used tuition and fees funding. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking that because when I talked to you before, the reason why um, with this procurement and the chief procurement and the decisions that's being made is the money came from two, two different sources. The first one, they never have enough money when you guys had the twelve or whatever change orders you guys had. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the chief procurement officer didn't decide 
that we're supposed to go back out to bid. So the reason why I bring this up to you guys and for both of you guys, when it comes to certain things that we want to do as legislators, you guys quick to go and compare stuff that's happening on the mainland. But then when we want to go ahead and compare our college and our researchers and things that we spend here on the island to the mainland, you guys disapprove. So I, that's why I just want to know where we're going to get the checks and balances and, and, and um, transparency when it comes to this, because it wasn't a small amount, because I, I remember it was about a million and the change orders was about four or five million. So the project would end up coming six million. So regardless of what fund it came out of, the procurement process was flawed and there was no oversight. And that's the reason why I think the whole thing with this procurement thing is trying to change some of the process to make it better um, for everybody. Because you, as yourself, just said to Senator Kim that you didn't think there was anything wrong and is our perception of how we felt things went bad. If any other any other contractor in the private sector would go ahead and a company put in a bid for 1 million and there's a change order for over 6 million, they lose the contract. They will lose the job because there's, there's the, the procurement process was flawed. But it seems like only, and I say this since I've been here, only when it comes to the university money, it's like the university prints different kind of money than the rest of the state, that that doesn't happen. So that's why, you know, I just want to know why when we try to, I guess in our perspective, like you said, try to take checks and balance and try to save taxpayers' money, you guys choose to pick the mainland when you guys want to, saying that the professors and the researchers get less pay than the mainland. But then the mainland professors and researchers bring in 80% to more of their salary. Over here, they don't. So that's what I'm trying to explain. So when, when Young was talking about certain things that the CFO do in other sectors, in other areas, I just want to know, why, why would we have to stay with the same rule if we can go and change the process of the procurement just to have checks and balances? Because again, you just said now to Senator Kim that you didn't see nothing wrong with all that change orders and stuff like that that was happening um, at Ching Stadium. And then, um, you know, President Lazener came before us. I mean, I don't know if he was the chancellor or the procurement chief, one of the three, telling us that it was in the best interest of, of the university. Whose interest? Because the taxpayer's interest is very much more important. So, I mean, can you, can you guys, I mean, any one of you guys kind of elaborate on that? Because I'm getting confused listening to the, to the going back and forth of why um, Lazarus should be, continue to be the procurement chair because this is how all the other departments are done. Um, shouldn't we have some kind of change because our checks and balances are not balancing out? You know, I mean, I understand you said, you said that to Senator Kim, but that's a big change order. So, and it was two different funds. We had to go from one fund to another fund to pay to finish the Ching Stadium, who again, we have permanent bleachers that are supposed to be temporary. Who oversees that? And you say you guys are the manager, you guys manage the project. It, it's, it's something that needs to be really looked into. So if, if you guys can try to answer some of that, I know it was a little bit lengthy, but I, I just want to know when we want to stop comparing things to the mainland when you guys feel it's, you know, for your guys' benefit. But then when it's not for you guys' benefit, you don't want to be like the mainland. So I just like, you know, when are we going to have a better checks and balances when it comes to our taxpayers' money um, and with this procurement uh, process? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, so, Kelbert, the University of Hawaii has, uh, we have a statue that gives them three years because they were at one point put under DAGs, correct? Because of certain violations, because of certain ways that procurement was handled. Unlike the DOE, the University uh, right. Proc Oversight Procurement was placed under DAGs, right. which is far different from DOE as we were trying to compare, or Jan was trying to compare them. And so uh, this past year, we extended that for another three years. But when that goes out, you could be directly back under DAGs. So is that what is preferred? 
that we take away the and put the uh, chief procurement officer under DAGs? Uh, so, so I think um, for both Vice President Govea and I, you know, in our testimony, we, I, I think the, the, the desire is for the efficiency of procurement for both the university and for the state. It is preferable that the chief procurement officer status stay at the university. Yes, and that's what this bill is trying to do. But if you right, don't right. feel but, that that shouldn't be, then we can put it under the state. Yeah, and and my point is is that um, I guess I would want for you folks to be clear about what the what are the internal processes, the mechanics of the processes, and the bureaucracy that basically gets layered in in trying to move procurement as an oversight. So have trying to maintain a level of oversight or insert another check and a balance. Mm -hmm. um, where procurement is actually not on that side of the organization, right? So right. on one hand, it's good to have like another check and balance, right? Right, always. Right. But understand that that's not the most efficient process flow, right? So you have to create a process flow. So there are some things, I'm, right. I'm not saying we need more positions because I don't know. Um, I'm not saying that time efficiency doesn't get impacted because I, I don't know, but those are the types of things that we, you know, kind of just brainstorming around what would be the implications or the impacts. Those are some of the things that I think you should also think about as well. Considering I understand. It, so, yeah. Because if you guys can, if the university can do a reorganization where the president becomes the chancellor, and now the president is also the chief procurement officer, and um, that, you know, and you are, you are the institution of higher learning, and you have the experience having been with the Maui County uh, I'm sure that this is not a project very difficult for you guys to figure out on how we're going to do that. And I am keeping UH in the loop and not taking you out of the loop um, to, to do that. Oh, oh, so, uh, one thing, Senator, if I can say, I, I would, uh, I, I am flattered that you would, you know, think about, okay, who, you know, who's at the university, what background I have, but please consider that if I am ever not <laughs> you know, whoever yes, the CFO but, is. But you're there now that's going to do the reorganization yeah. <laughs> or whatever needs to be done. Now, I also want to remind you guys in this committee that when we wanted the Board of Regents to, to have their uh, meetings be online and so forth, they told us it was going to take months, if not a year. And then COVID hit and they did it like in two months or less than two months. Um, you know, you guys built Ching Field. You, you've fell all over you guys selves doing Ching Field and you managed to get that done. When there's so many other projects that we keep asking you, and we're gonna be asking you this as we go over the budget, on why are things taking so long to close out? Why are projects taking so long when you can build Ching Field in like, you know, a blink of an eye? Of course, it required you to expand the scope of the procurement and to violate some of the procurement in order to do that, uh, but it was done. So I'm, I'm certain, and I know that you guys are capable of doing that. Because there are other alternatives that is not so desirable to the university that could be explored. Okay, members, any other questions? If not, we're gonna go into decision-making and we're gonna come back and then go into our budget briefing. So we are Okay, we are in uh, decision-making recommendation for Senate Bill 3340. This is the uh, Molokai Education Center that appropriates the funds. Uh, the recommendation is we pass with amendments, amend the bill description to clarify we are not purchasing the land from Kamehameha schools, but rather appropriating funds to UH Maui College for the relocation of the Molokai Education Center to land owned by Kamehameha schools and then there'll be technical and non-substantive amendments. Any discussion on that? Hearing none, uh, Chair votes aye. Passing out Senate Bill 3340 with amendments. Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Keith Agaron. Aye. 
Senator Glenn Pye. Yes. Senator Kurt Favela. Aye. Bye bye. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Senate Bill 91 SD1 relating to University of Hawaii uh, removes a special fund of the University of Hawaii and a cancer research center from the list of special funds that are exempt. The recommendation is to pass with amendment HRS 3630 uh, that the special funds of UH and um, for cancer research will continue to be exempt from the fees. However, we will require them to submit detailed reporting on each of the funds, salaries, maintenance of building and grounds, utilities, uh, general office expenses, implementation of IT policies, and adding on transfers into and out of the funds. Also, detailed reporting will be due uh, to the legislature no later than 20 days prior to the convening of each regular session. Um, members, any discussion on the amendments? If not, Chair votes aye. Senate Bill 91 SD1 to pass with amendments with five members present. Any reservations? Any objections? Hearing none, measures adopted. Thank you. Senate Bill 2302 relating to the Chief Procurement Officer designates the Vice President of Budget and Finance, the Chief Procurement Officer for the University of Hawaii. Recommendation members that, that we pass with amendments. We adopt the proposed SD1 language and if there's any technical or non-substantive amendments. Any discussion? Hearing none, Chair votes aye. Senate Bill 2302 to pass with amendments. With five members present, are there any reservations? Are there any objections? Seeing none, measures adopted, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, members. We are now going into our budget briefing. We did have a budget briefing with WAM. There were a number of questions that was raised and um, we this is, this is the meeting to go over them. Uh, also, the fact on been hearing from students and parents at the university regarding fees on how they're paying all of these fees. And this is the lay. I know, yeah, that's why I closed the door. I'm sorry, we have one of our members. If you can mute yourself, thank you. Um, fees are not being refunded, and parents are concerned about the, uh, the costs that their, their students and um, family members are incurring. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to go ahead and have, I'm not sure who's on still from the university. Chair, okay. this is um, David Lasner. I'm being prevented from starting my video, but I can speak. Okay. Uh, we, um, we don't have a hand in doing that. <laughs> okay. Uh, there I go. <laughs> Okay. Good thing I had audio so I could say that. Um, <laughs> Chair, we've been pretty thoughtful about fees. We do have people who can answer detailed questions. We only got this um, request very recently. Um, in general, our principle has been quite consistent, and I believe you asked us about this uh, previously. Um, our principle is that uh, with the advent of COVID, if a service can be provided online, uh, or virtually, then we continue to provide the service and um, assess the fee. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we did refund some fees on some campuses because we went online uh, at the, you know, in the middle of, a, of an academic semester. Um, and in the cases of fees for services that could not be provided, because they were purely physical, uh, unless there were debt service obligations uh, associated with revenue bonds, uh, we no longer charge those fees moving forward. So with that as the conceptual framework that we used across all 10 campuses, I believe we have representatives from all of our major academic units. Uh, we also have, I believe, Associate Vice President Hei Okimoto who, um, uh, for student affairs, who's worked with the chief student affairs officers, the student governments. I should note that many of these programs are student-run programs, and it's part of their co-curricular education to engage um, in some of these activities. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, and uh, we did have a 
and you did respond to a student's complaint that was sent in to me back in 2020, April 2020. And um, you did respond uh, to that. And this student talked about all the different fees, the student government fee, $5, student athletic fee, $50, student broadcast media fee, $3, student center operations and recreation fee, $175, student center program fee, $15, student, and these are all mandatory, by the way, student health center fee, $118, student publication fee, $13, student activity, SAPFB fee, $12, and student up pass transportation fee, $50, and a total of 441 for an undergraduate student taking at least 12 credits. And this doesn't include the um, lab fees and also does not take into account respective colleges who charge $500 per semester for their college fees, such as College of Engineering, Shiler, uh, School of Dental Hygiene, School of Architecture, and 1,000 per semester for School of Nursing. And then there was the uh, graduation fee. The class of 2020 was commencement was completely canceled. And so this $30 graduation fee. And I believe your response came in and the only fee you paraded was the athletic fee, the $50 athletic fee. I'm not sure what was paraded. Everything else in your memo said, no, 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 you didn't, you didn't give back or parade any of those other fees. So then I received recently uh, another complaint from another um, mother and uh, she was insistent about this. And so I told her we would bring this up. I will read this. My son is in his last semester at UH Manoa with the exception of one class last fall, he's been receiving his college education via remote learning. This past week, university students received an email stating classes will resume on campus starting January 31st. However, some class professors are being granted a two week extension, allowing them to remain online till February 14th. I interpret that statement to mean that those professors or instructors are probably not on island and need time to fly back. Prior to the start of the spring 2022 semester, students were told that in-person classes would resume. My son paid for off-campus parking as he did during another semester when UH anticipated a return to campus, but instead returned to remote learning. He could not get a parking refund for the prior semester, lost half of what he spent on parking in 2020, and now has already lost a month and maybe more for this semester. I asked my son if all of his professors are informing their students about returning to campus. He said that each professor is still deciding so remote learning for him continues. My husband and I work hard to pay for his tuition so that my son could, does not have to be financially burdened with student loans. He also works part-time. Uh, students and parents have received no tuition reduction since UH closed to in-person learning. It's frustrating to see on TV that UH allows fans to attend sporting events, but no in-person learning. Is there no COVID on lower campus, but COVID present present on upper campus. Public school students are, are not required to be vaccinated except for sports. University of Hawaii policy requires that every student must be fully vaccinated in order to return to campus. How can it be okay for public schools to remain open in person and accept remote learning from UH students? And then she goes on and on. How, so um, how are the fees being looked at? Because in your letter, President, you did say our campus will complete the necessary analysis for free fees collected during this extraordinary semester, identify which should be refunded according to framework and considerations, and develop the procedures we need to review what each of our 47,000 current students paid this semester and how to refund what they are due. So have those analyses been done? Uh, if you would like a campus by campus um, designation, um, I, I can ask uh, Associate Vice President Hei Okimoto to comment on how we have handled it. And if you would like us to look into the complaint you received, um, if you would forward it to uh, me, I know you know how to do that. Uh, we can look into the other matters. Um, I would differ with some of the assertions made, but it would be helpful to have that in writing so we can go through it um, comment by comment. Mm -hmm. We will send that to you. So is Thank it you. 
is the parking fees um, being refunded or not? Um, I do not know the answer to that question, but the campus is open. So the students have a choice if they want. They may come to campus to use the library. They may come to campus to use the rec center. They may use come to campus to use high speed network access uh, for their research or studies. They may be in a mix of classes that are both online and in person. So those are choices they made. We do have a process for requesting refunds. So if the student wanted to um, change their mind about the um, whether they wanted UH parking or not, um, that would be something they could request of the parking office. Well, I think what the what this parent is saying is that they were told that these remote um, the classes would start up again, and then it only to know I, that I understand that we were. Um, uh, we were not thrilled by the Omicron uh, COVID surge. I realize we are different than the DOE. I understand uh, the commentary. Um, we are also advised by our own health and well-being working group with our public health uh, professionals as well. And I mean, if you want to have a detailed conversation about those considerations, we'd be glad to. Um, in addition to the you know, the pressures on the DOE and I do not, um, I may have a hard job, but Superintendent Hayashi has a really hard job also. And there's a separate set of considerations around uh, teaching and learning for uh, younger children and the impact on homes and childcare that I know you're well aware of that um, create a different set of um, considerations, frankly, about the role of schools in society and the success of online learning uh, for young children versus the success of online learning for college students. And that's all part of what we weigh as a leadership team as we move forward and as we watch the devastation of the Omicron uh, variant through our community and, you know, through the university. So has, it, has um, classes started as of January 31st. So what percentage of classes are in person? I, I believe that's somewhere in the 485 pages of attachments. If you give me a minute, I can pull it up uh, that you requested uh, as part of one of the separate questions in the next segment. And again, this all varies campus by campus. So we were at different numbers of online classes um, at the beginning. Well, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about since you folks, according to this person sent me, it says Monday, January 30th, Aloha UH Manoa students, faculty, and staff. This is from UH. Monday, Jan January 31st is an important milestone as we fully reopened the campus for the first time since 2020. So the question is, what percentage of the classes are now in person, is it 100%? Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The question that was asked in writing was about last semester. Um, Provost Michael Bruno, who's online, if you have questions, uh, has just informed me by text that this semester Manoa is at 70%. Okay, so as of Monday, January 31st, according to what was sent to the students, that's not a correct statement that um, we are fully reopened for the campus for the first the time. The campus is fully reopened. That does not mean that every single class is fully in person. So re you may recall that um, at the height of COVID, we had actually closed the campus to anyone who didn't, all of our campuses, um, other than to people who needed to be on campus for a specific purpose. Okay. It also says in a limited number of courses, we have granted a two week extension to the online period. Our intention is for these classes to resume in-person instruction starting February 14th. So as of yesterday, were those classes all now in person? Um, 
So let me ask Provost Michael Bruno to jump in. I believe he is online here. Um, and he is responsible for the educational and research mission of the UH Manoa campus. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon, Chair. Um, in response to that question, um, nearly every single course that was delayed in going back to in-person is now in-person. We have only a handful of exceptions, and those were carefully reviewed by our health team. These have to do with faculty who are at high risk of severe illness as a result of the the virus. So uh, those faculty came to us with the request for health reasons to remain online. And we have reviewed those requests. Uh, again, it's only a handful of, of uh, instructors. I would say um, I can get you better information, but um, I would say on the order of, of 10 to 15 individuals who are at severe risk and, and we asked our, our um, health advisors from the School of Medicine to help us in that assessment. So it's, it's just a, a very few cases. The rest are all back in person. Okay, I hope that you will get that information out to the students that are affected. I mean, that's the whole point of this. It's um, certainly, you know, we all understand there are uh, issues, but I guess the parents and the students have some expectation based on what it is that you folks send out to them. So I hope that that information is being communicated uh, to them. Yes. I, to I totally understand and agree with you. And, and we've been uh, in ongoing communication with the campus, which includes the families. Um, one of the things that we are working on right now is exactly your concern that this is the accommodations have, have to happen on both sides. So yes, we want to accommodate those faculty who are at high risk, but at the same time, we know that students, many of the students don't do as well in the online environment. And, uh, and so we need, the, uh, we need the deans to address those instances directly to make sure that the students are properly accommodated. But I, I agree with your concern. And the professors have to be 100% vaccinated, correct? As well as the students? That's the policy? Um, the, so right now, as of this morning, we have about 97% of our faculty are fully vaccinated. Okay. Um, the, rest, the rest have had to request a medical or religious exemption. Mm -hmm. And in those, that is a very small number, something like 3%, they must produce a negative COVID test, either every three days or every seven days, depending on the test. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions on the fees portion of yes. this? Senator Tidani. Thank you. My question is regarding, um, like the student in the letter whose parents are working to help pay his tuition, if the class has to be retaken, will there be another semester fee charge? Um, you're, you're expecting that maybe online you can do most classes, but I'm sure there are classes where you require lab work, et cetera, that may, was not, they were not able to complete. Am I correct? The, um, so depending on the student situation, um, if they never signed up for a course, because it was not offered. I'm sorry, I'm not quite understanding the specific no, if, situation. If they signed up and paid for a course okay. because of the pandemic, they could not complete the course online because you needed in person, whether it needed to be labs, et cetera. Is there any situation like that? The only courses I know of where that occurred and um, Vice President La LaCroix can jump in here. I believe that happened in some of the career and technical education courses at the community colleges. And we did allow them to complete those courses um, subsequently after we were able to um, open the facilities. Is that correct, Erica? Yes. With no additional is, charge. No additional charge and they all completed. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Any other questions on fees? Um, if not, we can move on to um, the EAB contracts. And so uh, I know we talked about this briefly about the West Oahu uh, EAB, EAB contracts that uh, we received some correspondence obviously from somebody from West Oahu concerned about the costs. And we talked about the enrollment. Did you have? Um... I think um, Chancellor Benham is available. Yes, I am. I think, oh, here I am. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but I forgot my, my worksheet that I was looking at. But in looking at the enrollment for the last five years, it seems that the enrollment for every year has decreased. Is that correct? So if we take a look at enrollment uh, of all of our students, if you, um, on the worksheet from fall of 2017 to fall of 2021, the total enrollment has stayed steady at over 3,000. Uh, if you're looking at our first time freshmen, you are absolutely right that in fall of 280, uh, in fall of 2017, we did get up to 282. We had uh, some challenges with our organization in the following uh, couple of years. We, our number did go down. Um, if you have the chart in front of you, uh, fall 2018 to 242 and fall of 2019 and 217. Part of our strategic plan uh, was to address our organizational structure um, and, some, and the strategies that we're using. EAB at that time was actually an opportunity for us to focus directly on first time freshmen. And in our response, we, we looked specifically at creating a new application form that was much more intuitive and supportive. Uh, we also were able to learn from EAB uh, about five different ways of touch points of our, of our students. And in the fall, going into the fall of uh, 2020, we actually increased our number of application and started to see a, a turn in our yield. Um, but going into fall of this past year, 2021, we did, um, even though we had a high yield of applications, I mean, a high number of applications, it was difficult for us to tr uh, translate that into yield with the, the impact of, of COVID on our community. Yes, and you had only eight freshmen enrolled. Um, minus eight. Minus eight from the pre previous year, correct? Minus eight from uh, 232 in fall of 2020 to 224 in fall of 2021. So over the, the five years we're looking at, you're minus seven, 74 um, enrollment and 58 freshmen, but you continue to spend a million dollars in three years for the EAB contracts? Um, for our EAB contract, the total contract is 1,020,898. That's correct. Our portion of that is just 12%. Um, the university system did support us in this learning process so that we could turn around our strategic work that we were doing. It helped build our capacity as well. So I, I'm confused. So the EAB contract that we're showing here, FY 2020, 226,895. Is that for the entire university or is that just for West Oahu? 
Um, I don't have the entire university numbers in front of me. I just That's have, the West Oahu number, Chair. That's just West Oahu, right? Mm -hmm. So over the three years, it's over a million dollars. That's West Oahu. That's, that's sorry. I think Chancellor Benham was um, explaining that we co-funded these right. contracts for the campuses. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's where I, I was confused. Yeah. So on the F... May I ask one more question before I go back to you? So the FY 2020, where well, we spent 226895 that covered, started when? When did that EAB contract start? Uh, the contract started, um, I believe I'm, I believe I'm, um, I think uh, Vice Chancellor Javinar is on. I believe we started June 1st. Um, of 2020. June 1st of 2020. I'm trying to see, I, I know I have it here somewhere. Um, and in actuality, the contract was at that point in time, they were gonna help build, uh, construct our new um, application form, put in all of our digital touch points and collateral, and also uh, provide us with access to a variety of databases for eligible students, not only for the West region, uh, but for the state of Hawaii okay. and on the continent. Um, and when we did they were, complete that? When did they complete they, all they of that? They were actually, we did a mini. It was a mini. We actually um, weren't going to, they were building it when we started in June. So we were, we were already, um, we're, we're building it for the fall of uh, 2021. But because of uh, COVID hitting us in March, uh, we asked if they would do, would help us to, to build a sort of a mini push for that summer. Um, and so we went into a mini push between, I believe I'm, I, I could be corrected by um, Vice Chancellor Javinar. Our mini push went in for July, August, just several weeks to really push all of our digital um, touch points out. N July well, of what, 2020 or 2021? Uh, July of 2020, when we started our contract, they agreed um, to give us some, you know, a little push so that we wouldn't um, lose any traction going into fall of 2020 because we, we had very little idea of what would happen with COVID hitting our, um, our, our campuses, our feeder schools. And so um, that little push actually provided, I, I believe a little over, um, I think we're looking at about 900 um, application forms and that small little push for that small period of time. Right, and your enrollment went up uh, 119. And, yes, uh, first yeah, in that, in that but, short period of time, yes. Right. But yeah. in the short period of time, but yet when the overall period for fall of 2021, 20, yes. And it dropped 239 yes, it and, yes. and eight freshmen left. Yes. So I don't know that EAB really accounted for the increase in 2020 in that short period of time, because for the rest of the period, they had over a year and the enrollment dropped. And certainly it was um, partly to COVID, but yes. it continued to drop. And so I don't know what it is for, um, what it's going to be for 2022, but um, um, we are ending our contract with them in this year. So we have been in in June of this year. Our contract will be ending uh, with EAB, but we're hopeful that we, you know, we we have learned a lot about capacity. I mean, you know, what we need to do in order to reach out. We will not have access. Um, to the large databases that they had provided us in the past. Um, but we do have at our fingertips a variety of tools, digital tools that we can actually use in our region. So working with our high schools, um, again, um, to get those. Yeah. So um, Chancellor Benham, mm -hmm. when did the Creative Media Center open? Did that account for... Um, 
why you had an increase in the the freshmen that in 20 um mm. fall of 2020 um i don't don't have that all that number disaggregated but the uh creative media facility uh opened for students this this coming this past january um but it was open they were they were doing online classes um, from the facility in the fall of uh, 2021. And yes, uh, I would say that we were getting freshmen into creative media, a lot of transfer students uh, coming into creative media as well. Um, we are getting a number of freshmen around the cybersecurity, cyber ops as well, and teacher preparation those pathways, this, those three pathways into our academies and our high schools are well articulated. And I'm still not understanding why the nursing program was cut. And if you could provide um, mm -hmm. information for the years prior to that. Yeah, what that, I what have. The, what that enrollment was. Yes, and, do, you, do you have that? Hang on one second. I, I, think whether, that, I want to know whether or not the other community colleges saw an increase or colleges saw an increase in their nursing program after the yeah. West Oahu cut theirs. Uh, I, I don't know about, about that. We would have to ask. Um, uh, well, I think that college. you should care about the, the people, the, the students who wanted to go into the nursing program and it was suddenly cut because um, I would think that you would know that on the West side in particular, there are a lot of nursing and uh, you know assisted homes um, where uh, it's important for for those students to find a way to to uh, you know get their degree. And the whole purpose of UH West Oahu was to accommodate the students on the west side and the central side. So that's what. Uh, yes, yes, Senator, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I, I I know that there was a great deal of disappointment. I. I was disappointed as well. Um, well, you made the decision, so I don't know why you were disappointed. It was a it was a decision that um, that I made along with uh, UH Hilo, um, in in terms of, of continuing to support the program uh, going forward. Um, we we did have a very successful uh, number of of transfer students from our two-year program to UH Hilo's um, BSN program and, and did graduate a total of 41 students. And how many of, of them were from the West and Central side of Oahu? I would need to go back and take a look at the disaggregated data. I, I know we have that, I just don't have it in front of me and I can give that to you um, as well. I look forward it, to that information. Thank yeah, you. We'll, we will get that to you. Um, I, I do want you to know that um, since UH Hilo has uh, re, um, they have new leadership in their nursing program and faculty, uh, Chancellor Irwin and I have been talking about restarting this program. We have actually retained our nursing lead um, at UH West Oahu in the hopes of restarting uh, the program with either Hilo or with Manoa. So she's been with us um, this entire time and uh, she's the one who's been tasked uh, to work uh, with Hilo's uh, people as well. So we are, we, we are focused on, on doing that because I agree with you, it is, it is very important. Thank you for that. That's the greatest news I've heard all year. I, oh, thank you. I want to go back to um, the EAB again, uh, cost um, chancellor. Um, so, you know, it's very, I find it very troubling and disappointing that this program after a million dollars plus will be ending on June. Not that I, I feel we should continue it, but you know, we met it out over five years, a minus of 74 enrollment, minus 58 freshmen. And this program was for three years. And if we took the $1 million we paid plus for EAB and divided it by one year tuition 
for, for West Oahu at seven thousand five hundred eighty-four dollars, we would have netted one hundred and thirty-two new freshmen or one hundred and thirty-two new students, compared to a minus seventy-four over five years. So I mean, I'm just you know looking at the cost and looking at what we got. I don't know that this was a this was a very productive or um, efficient program. Again, you know, it's it does the money doesn't come out of your pocket, and so and I'm not saying that's your decision, Chancellor, but I'm just saying overall, um, when we're looking at how efficient we are and how we're spending um, resources and tuition funds. Um, so I just hope that as, as we look at these kinds of programs, that we do a better job in assessing as to what are going to be the benefits and how are we utilizing these funds. Um, I know we're going to have to stop because of uh, our time limit, but I do want to, I do have questions on the student housing, on in-person uh, classes, more the athletics fee, um, the general counsel contracts and active contracts, and I apologize that we don't have enough time, but Ways and Means have asked us to recommend the budget. And so in doing so, I do want to have these questions answered. So uh, we do have a hearing on Thursday, uh, three o'clock for a bill. And I would, um, 305. So we're going to reconvene at 306 to follow up on some of these other um, questions following up on the budget that we received responses for. And again, basically student housing, um, athletics, um, general counsel contracts, active contracts, uh, those are areas. And I don't know if members, you have any other areas you want to follow up on? Do you want well, maybe she'll have the, the numbers that we requested. Okay, on that. So if um, there are no other questions, and I know we have a hard stop, we are going to adjourn.